If you've got a Bible, why don't you turn to the book of Micah, still in our Old Testament prophets as we have been for the last several weeks now, being blessed by studying the journey, the life and the, the prophetic ministry of these great men of God. And tonight we're looking at the prophet Micah. So if you've got a Bible, why don't you turn there? We're going to read verse 1 and then we're going to work our way through an overview As is our practice, we're going to have a look at the the book itself, the prophecy, the nature of it. We're going to go ahead and take a look at at, at where the gospel is preached in this particular book. And we're also going to have a look at what practical wisdom the book of Micah can offer us today living as we do for Jesus Christ. So verse 1 of chapter 1 of the book of Micah, it reads like this. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham... Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So Micah is a prophet who dwells in the southern, the southern kingdom. As we've now labored this each week, the kingdom is divided after Solomon's reign among a northern kingdom, which is the ten tribes, and the southern kingdom, which is known as Judah and these southern parts. And in the capital of Judah is Jerusalem, the capital of Israel is Samaria. So when Micah prophesies against Samaria and Jerusalem, he's essentially prophesying against both kingdoms as the people of God. He's, he's a man from Judah himself. It tells us he's from Moresheth, which is about, about 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem. And he is basically a country guy, a village dweller, who's called by God to preach and proclaim some incredibly uh, notable things in the history of Redemption. So we're going to take a look at this tonight and we're going to see how Micah is used in the New Testament, how his prophecies are used as allurements to Christ and particularly where Micah fits in the story of Israel. So the last few weeks we've looked at Hosea, we've looked at Amos, we've looked at Jonah and we've spoken about how these are your northern kingdom prophets, your minor prophets who are in the northern kingdom and how the northern kingdom will be swept away first. All the prophecies and all the great work that God had done to bring this nation of slaves out of Egypt, to cause them to occupy this land of promise that God had promised Abraham, they were now going to flush down the drain because they refused to repent of their idolatry and refused to serve only the Lord God as he demands to be served. And so Micah is going to be a prophet from Judea, the southern kingdom. He's actually going to be alive when the northern kingdom will be swept away by Assyria. In fact, he's going to prophesy it. He himself is going to declare the northern kingdom will be brushed off the face of the earth into Assyria as slaves and servants. And the southern kingdom will come within a hair's breadth of being stolen away by the Assyrian army. We'll take a look at these prophecies in just a moment. The basic summary, the the basic message of the book of Micah, his prophecy is to stress that God hates idolatry. It didn't matter how pious Israel or Judah would go or how their highs and their lows of spiritual endeavor and their spiritual fervor, they always tended to maintain some affection for the Canaanite gods, for the the pagan gods that were in the lands when they came to possess them. They never fully cleaned the land out of that which God called them to clean it out. And they continued to worship the, the, the God of fertility, Baal, we know that God of. And they continued to serve these idols, even while they claimed to love Jehovah, to serve Jehovah, and to have Him as their only true God. So Micah stresses God hates idolatry, God hates injustice, God hates rebellion and empty ritualism, but delights in pardoning the penitent. That's the message of Micah. And it swings to and fro. Micah can be a difficult book. I I know each week as we announce the books we're going to teach on on a Sunday night that many of you take the opportunity during the week to read over the book. And I, I sympathize with you how difficult Micah can be because there's stuff in Micah that relates to that generation right then, right now. And there's stuff in Micah that hasn't even yet been fulfilled today, that yet we are waiting upon in the great kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so navigating your way through the book can be quite difficult, but grand, seven grand chapters of both declaration and promise in God's goodness. One of the things that I, I really appreciate in Micah is he takes aim at false prophets and false preachers. 
At this point in Israel and Judah, it was a very common thing for people who saw that you could be, you could be a prophet and, and you could be a preacher in the land and you could actually raise a significant income doing this so long as you prophesied the kind of things that other people wanted to hear. So in chapter 2 and in chapter 3, we find that Micah deals directly with criticism that he receives because he's preaching the truth of God. And when you preach the truth of God, you will always attract criticism. In fact, Micah quotes for us right here in Micah chapter 2, if you've got it there, when you read along with me, chapter 2, verse 6 to 7, Micah is now quoting what they have said to him. In Micah 2, verse 6, he, he, he repeats what he is told, do not preach, thus they preach. One should not preach such things, disgrace will not overtake us. So, so here's Micah, and he's been given a word from God, and here is the word from God. Stop sinning, or God will destroy you. How many know that's not a super popular message? Firstly, sinners love to sin. Secondly, they don't love to hear of pending doom because of their sin. And so these false preachers and prophets that have risen up, made a very comfortable lifestyle for themselves, have started to attack Micah, and they said, hey, 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 stop preaching this stuff. Disgrace will not overcome. This stuff's not going to happen, you doom and gloom apocalyptic prophet that you are. Just calm down. You're ruining this for the rest of us. We're trying to make a, a healthy living here. So we, we read on. They go on, and this is what Micah says. Should this be said, O house of Jacob? Has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? And so they began to accuse Micah of bringing a false message because that's not what they had seen as the character of God. They had an idea of who they thought God was. Basically, an incredibly large and benevolent, soft, cuddly toy was the God that they'd invented in their minds and their imagination. Micah comes declaring a God who uses pagan armies to squash the nation into the ground if they do not repent, and he's immediately an object of criticism. We look at chapter 2, verse 11, and we see the false prophets, the false preachers, begin to show what their message really is. We see it here. It says, If a man should go about and utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you wine and strong drink, he would be the preacher for this people. This is what Mike is saying. I know the kind of preacher that these people want. They want a guy who's going to sweep on into town, He's going to utter nothing but wind and lies, meaninglessness, but he's going to utter and preach and proclaim that God's will is that we live as sumptuously as we possibly can, live as luxuriously as we possibly can, and that will be the preacher that this nation will receive for themselves. They will not receive the preacher who is sent from God. Verse 5 of chapter 3, flip over again and let's, let's follow this as we continue to read now. This is what Micah repeats, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets. These people, these people who are uttering lies and wind and they're proclaiming nothing but a luxurious life on the back of God's favor and God's blessing. Before we read this, I want you all to, I want you all to hear the parody, right? I want you to hear the, the parallel with our own day today. Who are the most famous, the most popular, the most sought after, the favorite preachers of all are the ones who have never uttered a negative word in their life. They're the ones that the people want. They're the ones that the people will, will heap to themselves to be prophets and preachers who never ever preach on the reality of sin, the profanity and the offense it is to a holy God, and the judgment that comes to those who refuse to repent. In fact, the Bible tells us this. The New Testament, Paul says to Timothy that the days are coming when people will not sit and listen to sound preaching of the word, but rather they will heap up for themselves preachers who will simply scratch their itching ears. They have an itch and they want to be comforted. They want to be satisfied. They want to feel like all is okay and they don't want the gospel. So we see in chapter 3 verse 5, Thus said the Lord concerning the prophets, who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against him who puts nothing into their mouths. Therefore, it shall be night to you without vision and darkness to you without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced and the diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips for there is no answer from God. This is Micah, but as for me, I'm filled with power. 
with the Spirit of the Lord and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgressions and to Israel its sin. Before we even need to further continue our overview of Micah, we see something tremendously applicable here. Run from the preacher who never wants to declare the reality of God's hatred of sin. Run from that preacher. It was Richard Baxter, the the great Puritan, who once said this. He said, I like to hear a man dwell much on the essentials of Christianity. For we have but one God and one Christ and one faith to preach. Baxter goes on, he says, I will not preach another gospel to please men with variety as if our Savior and our gospel were grown stale. This is the call of the preacher. This is the call of one who stands and claims to be a mouthpiece of God regardless of when they live, regardless of where they live, regardless of their era. If we stand for God, we have one message. That's the message that God gives us to speak. It's interesting I've been reading a story, uh, a real story in the life of Adoniram Judson. We've spoken about him here before, so many of you are familiar with him. He went off to Burma in his mid-20s. In 1813, he sailed, no, 1812, 1813, he sailed to give his life to a country that was incredibly intoxicated with idol worship. There was no Christian witness in Burma. There were no missionaries in Burma. There was no one there preaching Jesus. And Judson goes there and gives his life, burying half a dozen kids in the dirt and two wives for the cause of the gospel. After 35 years, he comes home on furlough for a matter of months. 35 years in Burma, he comes home. And he's invited to come and preach in this this massive, prestigious mega church. And they they flaunt this event, they advertise this great event. We've got the great American Baptist missionary to Burma. Come along, hear the message, be inspired. And the the place is packed. They They have to send people away. And Judson comes forward and gets up to the pulpit as he's want to do and after 35 years in Burma you know what the people want to hear they they want to hear some great story some great triumph they they want to hear some great challenge something from the furthest parts of the world as far as their minds were concerned they they wanted a really gripping tale and he stands up and he speaks on the precious message of God who sent his son to die for our sins was crucified buried and raised to save us from perdition People are furious, absolutely furious. In fact, in fact, as Judson went home that night and he got on the train to travel to his next ministry engagement, one of his traveling partners couldn't help himself. They were completely aghast at this. They couldn't help himself. Uh, Judson, can't you see that you've been in Burma for three and a half decades? People came tonight to hear something of the, something of the story, something of the, the treachery and the triumph of, of, of your missionary labors over there. And Judson says, take a moment and think about me though. God has given me a mandate to preach nothing but the gospel. And Judson says, I will never have it said of me at the judgment seat. Oh, we went and heard him. He told us a great missionary story. That's when it will all matter, at the judgment seat of Christ. Where there will be thousands and tens of thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands who will curse themselves because they are damned because of their sin and then the next person they will curse is their preacher and their pastor who never told them the good news of the gospel. That's the message that saves. It is, according to Paul, Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God under salvation to all who believe. Even in our own day, you know it, you hear it, you're aware of it. Preachers everywhere declaring peace, peace, peace. God's not angry, God's not mad, God's not bothered by sin. God is nothing but a benevolent uh, super form of some Santa Claus and he just wants to help you out and give you favour and bless you and make your life rosy and peachy, but that's not not the gospel. That's not the message in the Bible. I love the fact that Micah takes these guys to task. I love the fact that they attack Micah first and he gets the last say, you prophets will have nothing but darkness. This is the word of the Lord, that God is an upright, holy, moral God, perfect and glorious and sovereign, and he has come in his son to save us from our sin. And so we find this reality that when we look at the book of Micah, it is a day and age where religion is rampant in Judah and Israel. Religion is rampant and yet 
Their religion is syncretism. It's a, it's a, it's a syncretic combination of the worship that God ordains and the worship that's infiltrated by all these other influences from these other religions, these other worldviews, these other philosophies as they try and conjure up some kind, of, some kind of synthetic view of how to worship God. And so their destruction is prophesied. Israel and Judah not only were failing to worship God as he had demanded, they were failing to demonstrate love and justice to the poor and needy in their community. They had failed to show the love of God because they had only seen to fill their own storage houses and fill their own homes with luxurious living. And they stored up for themselves prophets who prophesied that this is the favor of God and they got rich on this ideology. But what does Micah say? Chapter 6, verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. The Lord has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. There was this mindset that had been created by the citizens of Judah and Israel. This mindset was essentially this, that that because God is loving, and He is, and because God is forgiving, and He is, once we sin, we can simply go ahead and grab one of our lambs or our bulls and go down to the temple and and sacrifice it, and, and all's good. So as long as we have this contingency plan set up, sin's quite okay in God's eyes. God says, is this what I want? Do I want a thousand rivers flowing with the blood of your offerings? Is that what I've asked for? I've told you what I desire. I've told you what I require. That is to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. It's stunning because as I've already shared, Micah will prophesy that the Assyrian army will come down and will sweep Samaria Away, And all the northern kingdom will be dragged off into exile. And while Micah is alive, the very thing happens. And then Micah prophesies next that soon the Assyrian army will come down to Judah and entirely sack Jerusalem and sweep them all away lest they repent. And we know, we, we saw this when we studied the book of Kings, didn't we? We saw just how close they were to utter destruction. Absolute destruction. About 721 BC, Israel swept away. The Assyrian army comes down south to sack Jerusalem and, and overtake their entire, their entire lands. And yet then God gave a profound deliverance as the city repented and called out to God. Then Micah will prophesy at this juncture in his life, he will prophesy that Assyria will be humbled, but God will bring Babylon down upon us to sweep us away. And we know, as we've already studied this, haven't we, that it was the Assyrian kingdom that dragged the north and Babylon that dragged away Judah. It's a stunning prophecy because in Micah's day, Babylon was almost nothing of a country. It had almost no power, very little army, very little wealth or economy that was worth even recognition. And yet the word of the Lord came that Babylon will rise, Babylon will conquer Assyria, and Babylon will conquer Judah, lest we repent. We know that's actually what indeed occurred. About a century after Israel was removed, Judah itself was thus removed. But that's not as far ahead as what Micah is willing to prophesy. In fact, we've seen in Micah, he prophesies much further ahead than that. He prophesies that though the Israelites and the Jews and, and those of Judah will be swept away to Babylon, he in fact prophesies that God will restore them and that from one of their own cities will come the great king. In fact, this is part of Micah's prophecy. Chapter 5 Verse 2, Micah prophesied this, But you, but you, he says in chapter 5, verse 2, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. The majority of what Micah has to prophesy is pretty, pretty bad. It's pretty dark. It's, it's pretty gloomy and it's pretty macabre. It's all about death, destruction, and the conquering of foreign armies. But then there's this, then there's this gleaming light. 
that God is sending a king. God is sending a ruler who will be born in among the most insignificant of towns in Bethlehem. He is a king whose lineage is from the ancient of days and he will come and be a ruler of his people. This is the prophecy of the birth of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It was here, it was here that the the wise people in Jesus' day were able to study the Scriptures and see that that's where the king should be born. That's why the star hangs over Bethlehem and that's why King Herod sought genocide and infanticide against all the young boys in his own day that Jesus Christ is thus born and will reign as king over all. Not only that, but Micah also prophesies that Jesus Christ The Saviour, the Messiah, will be born in Bethlehem. But more than that, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, will be the division of all. He will be the great divider of humanity. There will be those who are either with him or against him. Either against him or with him. And it's actually Micah who first prophesied this. He says in chapter 7, verse 6, For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. Jesus quotes this almost verbatim to speak of the distinction that following Jesus manifests in our lives. I've said this before, it bears repeating again on the basis of this text tonight. That if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, if you claim to to march under his banner, under his lordship, and there's no conflict in your life, then your confession must be somewhere spurious. This is what Jesus does. The radical life that Jesus calls for demands conflict somewhere in our life. The culture all around us, the worldview and the philosophy of the world around us is so anti-Christ that unless you compromise, you will live a life where their conflict is manifested. So it was in Jesus' day, so it will be today. That he will be the division, mother against daughter and and father against son and and brother against sister. And the, the division that Jesus brings is necessary because he calls people out from where they are. This is the life Jesus says. He drags you out from your former life, your former way of thinking, your former practices and your your ideas and your worldview. And he brings you into an entire newness of life. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's prophesied all the way back In Micah's prophecy, this great statement about how profound a division that Jesus will bring. He said himself, I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. A sword is what I've come to bring, to strike division against those who will follow me, who will call upon my name, and those who reject the grace that comes because of Christ. We take a look at Micah chapter 7 here. We see that right here in Micah chapter 7, we're going to see that God is beginning to proclaim the good news of his message and his kingdom of grace. In fact, in verse 18, we'll start our reading. It's pretty profound because what I haven't told you already tonight is that the name Micah, the name Micah is a, is a short Hebrew form and it actually means who is like God, who is like the Lord, who is like God, and so we find in verse 18, Micah writes his prophecy and he actually drags his own name to ask the question. Verse 18 Who is a God like you? Who is a God like you, God, pardoning iniquity, passing over transgressions for the remnant of his inheritance? He, God, the Lord, does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us, he will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. This is where Micah finishes up. As I said, the the majority of the book is doom and gloom and rightly so. God is infuriated with sin. Sin offends God, as many a theologian has said. Sin is cosmic treason against the highest authority in the universe. Rebellion against Him is the epitome of unreasonableness, of irrationality, of foolishness. But God delights in steadfast love. God will, in fact, God will show mercy. 
He will not retain his anger forever. He will delight to show love. He will have compassion, tread our iniquities underfoot, and as it says, cast our sins into the depths of the sea. And of course, we know as we meditate on these prophecies, finding their fulfillment in Christ, we understand that for God to do this, for God to go ahead and provide this means of salvation, all of us are sinners. All of us have rebelled. All of us have found ways and contrived schemes to break God's commandments. All of us, and yet God is good in Christ. In Jesus Christ, God will forgive sin. In Jesus Christ, God will throw sin into the depths of the sea and only in Jesus Christ. Not in any institution, not in any man-made philosophy or false religion, only in Christ. It's there alone that God's wrath is abated and placated because of His sacrifice. We know the author of Hebrews says the blood of bulls, goats and rams and doves and so on and so forth. These things could never remit one small sin. But only the blood of the God-man, the blood of the Messiah, the king who is to be born in Bethlehem, will die on Calvary's hill to save his people from the pending judgment and doom that God has decreed is coming for all who are outside of Jesus Christ. The promise is sure. The promise is unbreakable. Who is a God like our God who pardons sins and passes over transgressions? The answer is there is no God like our God. No God whatsoever. The constant amazement for me is as I travel the world and engage with other worldviews and other religions is seeing this constant moral standard, this constant uh, ethical standard of, of goodness verified and repeated in all these other religions in the world. But the major distinction, the major distinction between Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism, whatever it might be, is that only Only in the gospel is God just and the justifier of those who are sinners. And only by Jesus Christ. All mankind knows that God is moral, that God is holy, and that we are neither of those things. How will God pass over transgression? How will God forgive sin? He will do it by sending a saviour. His son, born in Bethlehem, lived a sin-free life, died in Calvary, so that anyone who simply trusts in him, believes in him, and turns to him will be saved. All their sins, all their failures, all their moral fallings, past, present, and future, will all be lumped together and thrown to the depth of the sea if we are in Jesus Christ. That's the good news. Not only the good news of Micah, that's the good news of the whole Bible from cover to cover, that Jesus is the central figure, the hero of the story, and he dies on a cross and is risen in glory that we might be saved. There's no other way that we can ever attain forgiveness of sins with God but by the sacrifice of his own son, Jesus Christ, and only to all who trust in him. Who is a God like you? The Buddhists don't have one. Islam doesn't have one. Hinduism doesn't have one. All these man-made philosophies that create and conjure up morality as a means to get to God fail at their first word because they assume that we can earn a right standing with God. Who is a God like our God? None. Nowhere. Under no circumstance, there is no God like this one true, holy, awesome, sovereign God. He pardons sin, he passes over transgression, and he brings steadfast love to all who are in his Son, Jesus Christ. And that, friends, is good news. Would you pray with me as we ask God to bless our time together around this short, sharp, powerful, minor prophet of Micah? We thank you, Father, for the book of Micah this evening. We thank you that it reminds us that we are sinners. It reminds us, Father, just how tremendously furious sin makes you. It reminds us just how indignant you are against sin, and rightly so. And it reminds us that one day Bethlehem will bear a child who will be a king from a lineage of ancient of days, the lineage who comes from eternity. He will be the king of all who come to him. 
And Father, we thank you that as we we remember the King born in Bethlehem, lived a sin-free life, died on a cross and risen in glory, that we understand that now forgiveness of sins is freely ours because of our King. There's no God like you, God. There is no God anywhere in the world but the God of the good news of the Gospel. Only there, Father, do we see there's forgiveness of sins that a king would stoop so low and die such an ignoble death for subjects who come and call upon his name for mercy. Thank you, Father, that all our sins, if we trust in you, all our sins are washed away. We thank you, Lord God, that all this is found only in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the message of Micah, which reminds us again to turn our eyes to Jesus. He authors and perfects our faith. We thank you for the message in Jesus' name. Amen.